long time. Um, and I'll give more explanation about that, but I just think, you know, just realizing how fortunate we are to get a few months to sit down and actually write, uh, but also to be surrounded by people who do so. So, um, I will give a little bit of the background uh, and the context of this project, and my invitation to you is to suggest, tear apart, put back together. Anything you want will be very uh, useful to me. As Leila said, um, the main title, there's a lot of titles on this slide, so one of the things that you can help me with is uh, both in terms of content, but also probably if some people are marketing savvy here, uh, what do you think would be uh, in terms of what to choose from these titles, uh, or choose from the bits that would be a title for um, a book that would already be very helpful. But so on the words of episode science, is somehow um, in general a sentence that um, that brings together, I think, really the, the place from which I'm, I'm trying to write this book. Um, and then decolonizing westernized solidarity is actually the topic. So I think it has to be somewhere there, but maybe uh, not in the title. And then through epistemic blackness is, is somehow trying to say um, how I, I want to go about decolonizing in this particular instance. Um, and then dignity, repair, retreat, are some of the conceptual com uh, conversations that I want to bring forward as an alternative uh, in this context. So for all of them, I'll try to say something. I said 45 to 50 minutes, and it might be an hour, but then I will try to uh, organize my time. There might be bits that I will go over a bit more quickly. Um, I will signal them, and then obviously I'm happy in the Q&A to go uh, soon. So, um, first and foremost, in terms of an overview or uh, background of this book project, um, it's a book that I'm writing for the Quilombo book series of Roman and Littlefield, and I'll say two things about it because I, I'm just excited about the outlet, but I also think that there are many people in this room that um, I'd be interested uh, to, to look them up, but also they produce uh, a set of books that I think might be useful for us. Um, I will then say something about the topic that I said. Here I simplistically put it doing good, but I just want to give a little background on how I got fascinated by this topic. Now somehow uh, they translated that into something of a foreign policy. Again, something we can debate, I'm sure. Uh, and then I'll try to say two things about what I hope um, this book will contribute to. So that's my, my intention and my purpose. So the Kilomo book series, yeah, nobody can read that. It's, um, I'll just pick and choose, but I got that from their website, and it's a special book series from Roman and Littlefield, but it's put together by um, scholars that are in the UK, not all of them are still in the UK, but they um, somehow all hail also, to some extent, from a diasporic uh, experience. And what they, Mustafa Pasha, Mira Sabratnam, and Rory Shillian, and so the purpose that they have for the book series is somehow um, borrowing, and here it says, uh, the ethos of this book series is reflected by the bricolage constituency of the Quilombos. Quilombos being the settlements of Africans, enslaved rebels, and indigenous peoples in South America who became self-determining self political communities that retrieved and renovated the social practices of these diverse constituencies while being confronted by colonial forces. So in their mind, this is a type of uh, work that they're actually looking for, and I, I find it very exciting one, we are in academia and have to write, but it's also nice when you can actually put, um, uh, or to write them in that whole economy for others that actually have a particular ethos that might you know, fit with what we want to do. So, Quilombo as a series inquires into the shifting principles of colonial rule that inform global, global governance and investigates the contestation of these principles by diverse peoples across the globe. So somehow this is where I would like to plug in um, uh, this book project that I have. So these are some examples of the books that have already come out. For instance, Decolonizing Intervention by Mia Sabratna has helped me a lot in both my teaching but also in my writing. Uh, we're very old in Minyang, uh, who is, was here in South Africa. Uh, her doctoral uh, project, The Postcolonial African State in Transition, uh, also came out uh, with them. And then um, on the threshold politics of African anti-colonial archives, I'll come back to it. It's also it's an edited collection that also has inspired me a lot. So that's the first thing I wanted to share. 
to paint somehow a background of where I place um, this, this project. Um, my fascination with doing good, as I say here, um, I would say, I would, you know, highlight or uh, locate three, three instances or three um, somehow moments, but it's not necessarily in linear time, but uh, I'll present it in, in that way here. So first is my, yes. Do you mind just taking a pause so that we have people coming in? And okay. I, I recognize that, you know, that might mean uh, you know, taking a few minutes from the presentation. But no I think, problem. I think if we can give them uh, just two minutes to set up. Okay. I don't know. I mean, it's just, <laughs> just now. Thanks. <laughs> 
it stands in stark contrast, obviously, with the practices of, in this case, very specifically, um, a genocide where about a million people lose their life, and the actions of the European of the international community were retreat the first day. And again, there's so much to say about that. But I think those are some of the things that traveled with me while I was um, furthering my studies and. For instance, in my doctoral research project, I looked at the EU, what I call the ethical form policy, meaning policies that are uh, framed as those policies that are supposedly contributing to the good of people elsewhere, in contrast with normal form policy, where uh, we might be more explicit about, uh, first of all, our self-interest as, as countries. And you can think of development, you can think of democratization, you can think of um, humanitarian interventions, any um, of these fields uh, of studies. Um, long story short, and I mean a very long story, it took me 12 years to finish that PhD. The long story <laughs> is that it took me many, many years to understand that I was asking the wrong question. Right? So I wanted to understand how could the EU do better in terms of ethical foreign policy. But I understood at some point that um, maybe I was asking the wrong question. So I end up a very long story, a very long road by realizing that maybe the question should be, uh, should we, and in this case, I mean, let's say Western actors in this case, should we be there in the first place, especially if we take this doing good seriously to some extent. And so that's how I kind of ended my doctoral project uh, with engaging with decoloniality as a research strategy, as something for further research, and that's where we are today. And then lastly, teaching international development studies, uh, and that's something I've been doing for the last seven years uh, in the UK then, um, has also taught me to um, continue, obviously, in this project because you have every year a classroom full of students that plug into this desire to do good in the world, right? And the way that that has been formulated, uh, on the one hand, has made more and more clear to me that development studies is something that we might not be able to disentangle from both whiteness and coloniality but also because it's a practice um, that you do and that you should do with a certain degree of sincerity, that it's not sufficient to just be critical and just be cynical and not listen to about it, right? So what, what imperative comes from taking that seriously? So that's somehow to um, contextualize a little bit the topic. Um, and then what I seek to do with the book, and some of these points will come back um, to our presentation, is um, in general, I think I've tried to contribute, um, yeah, contribute to the field of anti-colonial IR to the extent that it already exists. And I think it does, we might not call it like that, but if we call it like that, Let's just do it, just you know, not to re the disciplines, but I think um, ideally if I say, and I like to claim that I'm an IR scholar, is to say that whatever we call IR today is not necessarily what I do, but because I studied the international, I want to be, no, I am an IR scholar. But within that, um, I think I want to contribute to an international relation discipline that is more explicit about its, um, about its normative projects. And in this case, for me, it would be trying to think and engage it with anti-colonial thought and practice. Obviously, even though I want to dismantle it, we do speak to the discipline of international development studies, um, global ethics more generally, and then also because, uh, as I said, being inspired by the teaching practice, I think, uh, or I hope that the project also speaks something to pedagogies of global studies in general, or studies in general. Um, in terms of methodologies, and I'll come back to it in more detail, I want to contribute to not just uh, engaging decoloniality as a research strategy, whatever, but also by thinking about how and why we do knowledge in a different way. And for that, I invoke, and I mentioned it um, to some of you already, um, something that has been said by, um, by a colleague of mine, Robbie Shigam, in his book, Black Pacific, where he makes a distinction between knowledge production and knowledge cultivation. The production being, um, he identifies it as something to do with colonial knowledge, where we just, you know, in accumulation terms, um, but you can recognize it in the way that we're often forced to present our research as the first, as the best, nobody said it, uh, but also the, the quantitative stuff that we have to produce, which somehow creates a very, I think a very artificial co uh, competition in how we produce knowledge that I think to some extent also explains how we leave so many sources of knowledge untapped. Uh, for one or the other reason. And so he speaks about cultivating knowledge as 
a bit to understand knowledge as something that is there for everyone and always present, and then doing knowledge or cultivating it is somehow the way that we tell that and we take that way. Right. Um, while people say that, we can take it to the citation. strategy and then also I, um, I like to use the book as a t the way to experiment with different registers right obviously it's still an academic uh, work but sometimes uh, if we're honest a lot of academic work is like really formulated in the most boring ways in which humankind can express itself uh, and, and I do think part of knowledge cultivation obviously is also to open registers of knowledge that we have not considered as academic knowledge before so um, I'm going to try and, and see to what extent we can do that also in academic books, uh, because it, I do think it opens ways of, of understanding or sense making that again we might be. epistemological um, contributions that I have in mind um, is on the one hand this epistemic blackness that I will come back to, um, but maybe and that's maybe also something to do with uh, method or methodology. <laughs> contributing to and curating something of an anti-colonial archive. <clears throat> this I have from this book that I mentioned before, The Politics of African Anti-Colonial Archive, and what they say here in terms of curation that I find also, again, generative and um, useful is um, it's something that African, African anti-colonial archive, or archive in general, if we want to understand it in an anti-colonial way, is something that requires curation, rather than the re-erection of this is the archive and this is what we all have to tap into. Um, and so they mentioned curating an African anti-colonial archive is not a matter of retrieving from some pre-existing already collected body of work, but rather the project of locating and dislocating texts, ideas, structures, music, images, and the like, and arranging them together in new ways. Lofty ideals, but it's <laughs> ways in try. There's some of the ways in which I try not to be intimidated by this whole book project. Um, so in general, what I would like for this to be, but and I and I put this here because I think many of us, or we might be trained better in deconstruction, especially if we go from critical angles or if we want to. Uh, but um, I think some of the decolonial imperatives are just are also to try and go beyond just by deconstructing what's wrong. By now, I think um, more and more we do know what's wrong with, for instance, uh, Western uh, uh, development practices and studies. But you know, what does it mean to answer a, a, a challenge of so what should what could we do then? Not necessarily what should we. And so I don't want to answer it as a singular closed way but somehow contributing to some answers. Um, decolonizing westernized solidarity. A few quick things I want to say here is um, that I really understand my project um, as limited, which uh, all projects are and should be also, from the particular place from which I speak. And I mentioned uh, being second generation, random, growing up, uh, being born in Belgium at the moment, I'm in the UK. So I very much understand this project not as um, something that wants to speak to development everywhere in all places, but very much trying to understand what would a decolonial approach to development thought and practices that comes from a Western positionality, you know, what would that look like? And specifically then I think that um, having this experience or um, the, yeah, the relational experience of being from the diaspora brings uh, ways of understanding that reality in a different way uh, that I think could be um, generative for this project. Um, the other um, rationale, obviously, is to somehow um, address of the reason why I guess I want to get rid of international development or westernized development. Uh, in summary, I think some of the problems of international development, but its practice of studies, can be summarized in terms of that there is a huge bias of presentism in the sense that a lot of development thinking starts at a 
um, it doesn't even start necessarily. It's often that we have conversations as if the problems exist in a, in a time vacuum. So we don't have to specify necessarily how we came to many of the problems. And especially from a Western positionality, this is built on systematic colonial nature, right? So it seems that you know poverty falls out of the sky and technically we can intervene into that. So the bias of presentism somehow uh, invites the bias of technocratism, where there's a huge depolitization of many of the problems that development studies tries uh, to address. And then finally, a bias of whiteness and Eurocentrism. And I think even though I say that this is from Western positionality, I think a lot of uh, development thought that is being uh, circulated around the planet through international institutions and everything um, makes that this is not just a problem of white people in the West, unfortunately. Um, and so I think to make a distinction between white with a small w or whiteness and Eurocentrism is a useful analytical category uh, for, for us to engage with. And so one useful definition or engagement with that I found from uh, my colleague um, Clive Gabay, who just uh, uh, published his book, Imagining Africa, Whiteness in the Western Gaze. So he speaks to whiteness becomes something that goes beyond the color of a person's skin to structure ways of acting and being in the world that are normalized all the while, that such norms are held to have derived from people with a particular racial phenotype, and that act to normalize people who do not act according to these white norms of social behavior. So in that sense, whiteness is both narrower and broader than phenotype, excluding some phenotypically white people according to class, geographical, ethnic, and religious criteria, while embracing some non-white people according to similar standards. This is how some groups of people can become white by acting white with a W, it's a capital W. What I find important here is not necessarily when we refer to people or groups of people, but I think that the core of what the desires are of international development is something that we can call um, whiteness uh, in the sense of liberal market democracy as the way to go. It's not just that it's a good idea or not a good idea, but a lot of the violence comes from the fact that mythological mistake it came from the West. Hence, it includes or it needs or necessitates a Western presence to reproduce that in very, very short. But I think um, this is some of the reasons why I, um, like I said, the, the second line, I think it should be seen or um, at least um, understood as undesirable or impossible to decolonize international development. It's for these reasons that I don't think we should try to, uh, to salvage it. In addition to that, I think the reason why I, I have no problem making statements like that is that I, I don't recognize in the international development project any concerted effort to dislocate power since the colonial times. And in that sense, it's a continued colonial uh, system of governance that does not even require bad people sitting thinking we want to still be colonized. It's just uh, a thing that, in, in any case, still did not or does not dislocate power or does not uh, pay enough attention to that. Um, and so that's where the uh, invitation to reflect on how not to get rid of everything is still the desire to contribute to something positive, uh, and here I just call it solidarity, but um, the invitation to then reimagine what that could look like if we were explicitly acting Um I have no clue about time, because I still have a lot to say, but... Okay. <laughs> so, um, I spoke about method methodological um, uh, contribution, um, as decoloniality as a research strategy, uh, obviously here I don't think my contribution is necessarily that I bring something that new to uh, the scholarship that exists. What I will try to do is somehow to summarize uh, some of the uh, many different tenets within um, that literature and how to think about it as a research strategy um, and um, as something that is tangible and maybe applicable uh, to different research areas. Um, some of this I, not everybody was here, I mentioned last week, so I'll try to, um, the slide is up there, but I'll try to go a bit slightly quicker, but we can come back to this um, in the Q&A. A uh, first distinction that is useful uh, to, to make in that, um, in that approach is to obviously draw the distinction between colonialism as a moment or as a flag planting exercise, something that we can trace in time that happened in different places that continues in different places, 
and coloniality um, as a, a system uh, of power and all the structures that keep extreme power and inequality uh, in place. Another useful way for me to think about coloniality is as uh, this triple system of destruction. Um, and if we think about this, then we see we can use it as a device to try and understand some of the violences that we see around us. So that we also, uh, it's, it becomes very apparent that this, this issue of coloniality is not something from the past, right? So coloniality then as um, a destruction of certain people's genocide, so we go beyond the legal definition that we have today, that goes hand in hand with the killings of, or the destruction of the systems of knowing, uh, knowledge is, um, practices, and then um, which goes hand in hand with the destruction of their life environments. Um, yeah, I think we have enough examples in our everyday life to see where these things still apply. And when I'm in Europe, I often use the example of, um, I wouldn't say the East, but just the mean fact that it happens with which thousands of people die in the Mediterranean while the whole European system continues, right? There's no state of emergency for that. It's useful to try and understand that rather than, again, a technical glitch in which the EU is technically not capable of opening its borders to everyone, there is a system in there in which um, the disposability of certain lives is, is organized politically as well, uh, but also sustained in our knowledge systems. Um, lastly, I think the, um, to understand coloniality, and I got this from Enrique Dussel, but also um, through the writings of Sabeo, something that really came uh, to the fore for me, is how to distinguish decolonization or decoloniality as a research strategy as something more than the next step um, or the next move that you know work academics need to do, like uh, what's next, you know, and we've had many of these, these critical uh, junctures. What I find insightful is when we are forced or we force ourselves to engage with this distinction to the will to power, which uh, the cell would you know, um, associate with coloniality over the will to life. And so in that sense, it really helps us think in terms of decoloniality is more than just saying now it's our turn. Um, without engaging in how we would use the term to do something else that is much more uh, engaged with the uh, world to, to life, um, more generally, I think. It's a bit, it's a bit abstract, but I, I wanted to put it up there because I, um, I, find, I find it useful. Uh, so the three strategies that I will try to somehow um, uh, speak to in um, the book that I've also uh, used in teaching um, is somehow to engage decoloniality with, um, and it's, it's a division I make for analytical purposes, not necessarily because that's how reality can be observed, <laughs> or is. Um, it's in terms of ontology, so what is it that we know, how do we understand the world to, to, be, to be organized, to function. Um, to engage uh, issues of uh, epistemology, so how do we know about that world? And then um, to anti-colonially decolonize is uh, how do we engage with why we want to know stuff and how does that relate to the material conditions of uh, the possibility and the quality of life. So the coloniality, when it comes to ontology, actually invites us to really sit with the fact that, I wouldn't say most, but really a lot of the ways in which we understand reality and the connections that are there are deeply mythological. And, we, and to briefly connect this to international development, the fact that development is as, uh, international development practices and studies are associated with an idea of, of gift or aid or help, um, I, I don't know, it's, to say that that is deeply mythological is, is to express it in a nice way. I find it more useful uh, lately to just call it obscene because it's something that only makes sense if we cut out the whole, like I said, the whole history. And then we start at the moment that, uh, and again, when I say we in this case, I mean Western actors, um, we start at the moment that we decide to do something, and then we can call it help. But if you start the story somewhere else, then it's, it's um, then we will have at least to explain slightly longer why you think you can call this help. <laughs> this is not just about guilt or payback or whatever. It's, um, it's I think, where we locate the fact that uh, international development studies maintains the colonial relation of power. Because you don't have to dislocate power if you continue to be the one that gives and that can decide when we give and we take. But if you um, 
if you say using the word aid or help is obscene, let's turn it around and if you have to give something back to me, then the, the power is dislocated because then the gender setting also happens somewhere else, right? So for me, that's, that's just an example of, uh, of the mythological, but also obviously uh, the, what I mentioned earlier, um, the Western or the white genius in terms of industrial revolution, enlightenment, all these things. Again, there we see that only half of the story is being taught. Uh, and it's also the basis on which this idea that a lot of the solutions for development challenges worldwide naturally would come from the West is based on that myth of the West or the Western genius. If we again then would say, let's um, re-entangle stories that have been fragmented, uh, this is something that uh, decolonial scholars have done. They say we cannot talk about modernity without adding the slash coloniality, because literally in a material sense, but in anything, it's always been a story that went hand in hand. And it's not just it happened to happen at the same time, it's, um, it's co-constitutive. Co um, and so I think in terms of um, demythologizing, uh, trying to think where do we tend to start the story, uh, what would the story look like if we moved away from Eurocentric understanding of them, uh, but also what if we were to uh, look at what has been fragmented and what we want to put together. It really, um, it just paints a different picture, but also a huge um, potential field of imagination, let's say. So this is not just to be seen in a super negative way. It's just like, um, yeah, what, what fields of thought are opened up when we say, let's get rid of this idea of aid. But we still have a relationship there that we need to do something with. Um, sky is the limit, basically. Um, you know, one of the ways in which this uh, mythology uh, is being maintained, obviously, is in how uh, our power knowledges um, are um, constructed. So this is speaking to epistemology. Very briefly, I would say again, it tries to answer the question, who do we tend to um, address as the experts in whatever topic that we're studying, right? But again, in terms of international development studies, it's... Um, Again, if we denationalize it, it doesn't actually make sense that those peoples that have not, um, have no proof of record to actually be able to survive, let's say, poverty for the longest time, tend to still be fundamentally overrepresented in anything that we call scholarship and expertise when it comes to development uh, challenges. Um, but just not just that, I think it's also about trying to rethink what we call or what we understand as expertise. So I would say that the problem of a lot of the knowledge systems we have today is not just an underrepresentation of brown women, uh, something that you know people have caught up, caught up on uh, at the moment, but it's maybe use, more useful to uh, see it as um, a, a white male overrepresentation throughout the humanities in terms of sense making uh, of our realities. Here again, it's important, I think, to highlight it's not just by adding then these other voices, but what are the places from which we theorize? Because especially in development studies, we have discovered rural women to whom we then ask, do you want whatever? It's not the same, because that is just adding voices, and often, um, in many cases, we do use uh, people to, uh, for empirical purposes or illustrative purposes, but the theory of theorizing, or the starting points of the questions, continue to be uh, located um, in this place that I call uh, one uh, where we see uh, uh, over-representation of white um, men as a structural problem. Um, the ways that silencing uh, represent, uh, manifests themselves can be in many different ways. Um, can be in terms of simplifying when it comes to the African continent. Um, you know, there's this satirical website called no, it's not a satirical website. It's a website with a satirical name, Africa is a Country. I mean, um, yeah, I don't have to explain that much about this, but this is a way to, to, um, to understand silencing because there are places and people that can exist that we don't need details about because we just don't. Delegitimation, obviously, of knowledge is from certain places, but also practices. Um, the ease with which my students, when I ask them what's the problem in Africa, I just point at corruption and bad leaders. Um, it's, it's, again, a very simplified uh, way, but uh, obviously erasure, over-representations, but also, as I said, I think um, we need to address how we privilege rationality to solve all life's problems um, when it comes to the academy, and uh, a lot goes uh, there. 
And then finally, um, I think the coniality engages us in, as I said, um, be more explicit about the normative project, to put it very simplistically. Whether we are explicit about it or not, knowledge is either contribute to the colonial status quo or into something else, right? And often in the academy, we are invited to, under the mantle of objectivity, not always necessarily address this. So I would say that that is. Um, and the, next, the other thing that I find useful why I address materiality is um, to somehow move beyond the two first ones that might look that they are mostly. Uh, to do with uh, knowledge as a representation and the immaterial aspects of coloniality. But the reason why they are important is because they are real life consequences and I come back to um, the, the disposability of certain lives and the possibility or impossibility uh, of life, or quality of life uh, for some and how that goes hand in hand with how we um, do knowledge. In terms of uh, development, then again, I think one of the manifestations is even though we speak about bottom-up development, about um, grassroots and everything, the huge background continues to be somehow something to do with there is no alternative to liberal market democracy. There are variations in there, and I'm, and I'm, and I'm generalizing. But um, I think especially when we are um, here and maybe as Africans trying to think what is it then that we desire for a different societies, we see that this there is an alternative kind of thing or these desires are, are shared sometimes as well, right? But I guess the point that I want to make here is that it will be very difficult to be serious about decoloniality if we think we don't have to engage with capitalism as the only way of organizing society. Doesn't mean that you know we have a preset uh, alternative there, but I also do think that there's so many alternative practices that exist that do not end up on the menu of all the different alternatives that could be there, and to what extent can our knowledge just um, engage with that? Okay, how much more time do I have now? Twelve minutes. <laughs> And then I'm at 50 or at 45. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 12 minutes to go to uh, finally the empirical stuff. <laughs> um, so, epistemic blackness, what could I mean with that? And a lot of what I'm going to say now is stuff that is still being, is still being developed, and I really you know, can't wait with what you could um, contribute to this. Uh, I guess one point that I would want to make that maybe I don't have to make everywhere uh, where some people might actually know that already, but um, there are other spaces, especially in the West, where I have to make this very clear, that it's not necessarily blackness as something, as a fixed identity, it's not a preset superior way of knowing or being uh, in the world, but it's in a, in a relational way. Uh, I think I'm foregrounding blackness here as a place of knowing, the reason why at this moment in time I consider it as an important place from which to try to know the world is very much because it has been subject to this epistemic side. Maybe more than others, but mostly it's not a competition, it doesn't even matter. And also I'm not necessarily projecting it as this is the only way we should know the world now. But from the very um, colonial history in which um, the black experience, and I mean I broadly say it as, uh, or I focus on people of African descent wherever they might have uh, been or they might be at the moment. Um, yeah, they have, they have um, especially uh, been subjected to the erasures of, um, of their knowings but also experiences as a place to know not just themselves or development challenges or, or whatever, but the world, right? So I see it as a generative place from which uh, to know. And um, I think it's particularly interesting for an anti-colonial endeavor because the African or the black experience has been subjected in a particular way to the colonial experience generally in the last 400 years. Um, I guess that's in the most simple terms a justification if we ever had to give one but, um, for, for that approach. So um, I... I'm giving two blurbs or examples of um, of how we could understand. One is by Christina Sharp, um, 
she just um, published a book just 2017, um, In the Wake on Blackness and Being. And um, I found what she writes here um, useful, and again, it refers back to what I was saying about doing knowledge differently, uh, curating uh, gatherings. So she says, I've been trying to articulate a method of encountering the past that is not past. A method along the lines of a sitting with, a gathering and tracking of phenomena dis that disproportionately and devastatingly affect black peoples any and everywhere we are. I have been thinking of this gathering, this collecting and reading towards a new analytic as the wake and wake work. And I am interesting, interested in plotting, mapping, and collecting the archives of the everyday, of black imminence and imminent death, and in tracking the ways we resist, rupture, and disrupt that imminence and imminence aesthetically and materially. So that I found um, a useful one, Malcolm. Um, other one for you to read, but it's another way of trying to understand uh, epistemic blackness, as I said, not as a re-erection of a new uh, discipline or a new archive or a new fixed thing from which then we have to uh, pick and choose things, but much more as a, I wouldn't say random, but a dynamic, uh, more open-ended uh, something. I don't know to what extent this is really important, but um, I'm sure we'll see this, in, but sometimes I feel it important to, to highlight this. Um, and so for my project, the way I've tried to think about it is uh, as both something to do with re- or excavating stuff, and then re-entangle it, putting it back together in a way that maybe we weren't doing before. So um, what I have been doing concretely, uh, because again, this is a book, book project that I've been working on, not on the book itself, but on the research uh, for the last six years. So I hope I'll finish before the 12 years. <laughs> Set my own record. <laughs> um, um, so the re-excavation or the excavation, um, I attach that most of the field work that I've been doing. And I'll go over that again briefly. And I'm happy to answer more uh, questions in, in the Q&A. And then re-entangling is basically, um, you know how I think when I said that it, I took a long time to finish the PhD and everything, but also when I look back at what I had in school, but also how I'm teaching today or trying to teach today, uh, the feeling that I share with my students as well is that we feel cheated in our educational system, right? So the moment that you start presenting alternative uh, literatures or peoples, there is the sense of how come, how come we didn't know this? So I guess I'm trying to use this book for. Uh, just put it together. Also, the, the joy of discovery, not as an, an, as an open ended uh, activity, so where I re entangle a lot of um, the, the thinkers and the peoples um, that I have encountered in, in that re discovery or discovery. The field work, very briefly, uh, was located both in uh, Somaliland, um, in the US, and um, in Rwanda. And they are the places, and let's say that the time span is more or less 2011 until 2016, more or less. Um, in all places, I did interviews, mostly because of language uh, limitations, meaning that uh, in Somaliland and Rwanda, I know I do not speak, for instance, uh, Somali or Kenya Rwanda, but um, the other colonial languages we do speak. So somehow to also be conscious of that, uh, cognizant of that, I. Um, I focus mostly on uh, expert interviews, often as colleagues or politicians, NGO people. Um, and so in the case of Somaliland, what I asked was, um, because of a context of a very limited moment in time in which they did peace and state building in the relative absence of the international community, in the present, how do they understand um, the contribution of the international uh, community to their state and peace building. A lot of interesting stuff um, came out of there. In the US, uh, again, interviewing colleagues, but also um, students, the very simple question, what does black power mean to you uh, today? And um, in Rwanda, uh, I focused on the concept of uh, Agachiro, which is um, a philosophy pre-colonial that is not um, exclusive to Rwanda, let's say, but um, that is attached to putting value in 
in oneself, in others, um, but very much also to do with ideas of dignity. And so the reason why I came across it is that it had been, or it has been, um, re-evaluated, reappropriated as a as a public um, as a public policy uh, somehow as part of the post-genocide reconstruction of society. So there again, I asked the question: What does Agachiro mean to you? A lot of stuff came out of it. Very briefly, this is how I ended up with these three concepts. Because these three seemingly instances, and I don't use them as case studies because asking one question doesn't make you a country expert, right? But I wanted to use them as places from which to theorize about concepts that might as make, um, think about what development supposedly uh, is doing on solidarity could do. Is uh, this recurrent idea of dignity in all three of them. Um, the idea of reparation is slightly more clearly uh, developed or expressed in a, a U.S. context, uh, I think, uh, between these three. And even in Rwanda, I have often disagreements with friends and colleagues who say, don't keep us in the past, we do not want to ask for reparations, we have our own stuff to do. But it made me think about these positionality things. I, I think that in a Western context, it doesn't mean that you still don't have to think on how to repair what you brought. Um, and then this whole idea of retreat, especially from the Somaliland experience, it made me think that we do not study seriously enough what happens in the, in the moment of, of Western absence, however we define it, and I think that could be a part of it. So, um, let me quickly then say in two minutes something about the re-entangling bit this is uh, mostly this research, so obviously a lot of the Black Power stuff, uh, but also any of the other field works or case studies uh, also require um, uh, this uh, research. So I want to re-entangle some of these interview insights uh, with, with the realization that a lot of our questions about anti-colonial solidarities, the answers are, are there. Right? And it's about um, not also thinking that there are similar answers, obviously, but what happens if we re-engage and we create a different conversation between these many actors, thinkers, and often actors that we've seen mostly as actors, but actually are theory, or people that have been making theory for us, but then somehow they fall out of our theory books when, uh, if, and then when we study them. So I just put like a part of a random list there of you know the first names that came to mind, you'll see that they're both practitioners, past, present, um, but also thinkers. And so I'm still trying to think how to work those in. Um, I don't think I will use a geographical distinction, like the first one you see focused on the continent, second one, the Caribbean ones, um, the US and North America, let's say, but then also I realized being from a European positionality, they were very late to the game. There's a lot of black thought that is being developed at the moment. Uh, I'm not sure I want to make a distinction saying that different stuff came out of different places because most of these people travel so much. But just what happens if we try and tap into these, these many ones? How do they speak to these uh, topics? And so that's where I come back to this idea of on the ruins of epistemic side. Um, I think my question when engaging with them, and especially um, I had a chance to engage a lot with thoughts and practices of Thomas Sakara, is a question that keeps haunting me, is what were we meant to forget? So it's not just about writing biographies or whatever, which I also do think, but trying to think what were we meant to forget, because maybe there some of the anti-colonial answers um, might be located. So I really hope um, I'll find the answer at some point. Uh, so I'll end here. This is what I have in mind at the moment in terms of um, how the, the, the book structure could look like. Um, you'll see that everything I talked about somehow comes back here. But I guess especially when it comes to now chapter 4 and 5, where I make this distinction between the fieldwork stuff and then to then set up these three concepts of dignity, repair, and retreat, how we entangle them maybe with the other stuff. Um, in terms of those terms, those concepts, or should I organize it differently? I don't really know um, yet, but um, maybe just to say that in terms, I could repair rather than reparations, because when we say reparations, often people immediately start counting what, what you, you know, who's going to give back what to whom. But it's more, it's more than that. But if we're not willing to also answer the very practical question, 
we know the topics of it. But repair them to be understood as both reparation, restitution, retribution, any of these things. Um, any practice that somehow dislocates the power in the solidarity conversation that we need to, to have. Good, that's it. Thank you so much for your time. So I'm not sure how many questions there are, but Olivia and I have talked about possibly taking two or three questions at a time so that we can try to make sure everyone gets to interact. Um, also, I would ask that we resist our urges to uh, give extensive uh, historiographies and genealogies of the things that we know um, in order to make room for the conversation. Um, so with that said, um, uh, thank you so much for this uh, fantastic presentation. I really love your project. Thank you. Thank you so much on so many important issues that we are dealing with. I am. Um, I have just two questions, comments. Um, the, the, the first one is about, you know, I think the stuff that you, that you have inside, uh, the, the moon being the evidence, you know. Uh, so, what, so what is your, what, what, what is the nature of your fieldwork, like in terms of disciplines, it's a kind of anthropological fieldwork. I know that you have a lot of archival work and so on, and this is, uh, and this is, uh, this is very, interesting as well. And the second question is about the, the title of, of your book and uh, the concept behind the title of your book. Uh, what do you mean by uh, epistemicide? And because what I think you're trying to do, and I think this is the work that has to be done, you know, because we have like a whole production of knowledge productions uh, as you could decide, you know, that, that kind of very particular context that have particular structures of power behind it. So and then, so how how would you relate these to sort of the emergence of a new epistem that is related to blackness, to black studies? What would play contribution to universal knowledge? Mm -hmm. um, that's more a question on methodology and the like, list of uh, resources that you have. I see there's an absence of uh, fiction writers who you know, also uh, uh, have collections of essays like Tony Morrison or Zadie Smith. And then the other one is um, social media. Did you leave it out because it's just too large? Or? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Myself, um, I would like to ask you concerning colonizing international developments. Uh, how do you, uh, can you maybe clarify concerning uh, doctors without uh, borders, the business of here? So, like, what is the impact on Africa? Very, um, very important, or they are not important for black people? Thank you so much. Um, I'll also try to, to be brief and <laughs> concise. Um, in terms of the empirical nature, let me, um, I'll try and think. So for instance, um, I think in the first place, what the empirical research has helped me to do, um, because I'm, I'm, I, I did the interviews as, as an IR scholar, not as an ethnographer or an anthropologist. Uh, very much because I was, you know, trying to think through the implications of the limits of who I was interviewing. So um, I was trying to find because I think somehow, just before I started doing that research, when we engage more with critical research, um, let's say the post-development research, when we know all the critiques about what's wrong with development, again, like I said, I'm not saying that many new things. I was trying to understand how come we actually know everything that is wrong, but then somehow there is a reproduction of this whole system, where this is how we teach it, that continues. 
And so I think that's what inspired me to literally um, go and ask for some of these insights again, literally to the people concerned, and how that has helped me to center what they say, not just as a critical exercise, but um, very much what happens if we center their insights. So I'll give you an example. In Somaliland, um, I was uh, talking to the Minister of Planning. Um, Somaliland not being a country that is officially recognized, and that has very much um, implication when it comes to the money and how they get the money from the World Bank, for instance, or IMF. I think they changed it recently, but for the longest time, that meant that they only could apply for project money because the big loans, whatever they need to go through national governments, in this case, I would be Somalia. Uh, but still, international institutions are very happy to give to Somaliland because it seems to be one of the more stable regions in which then they can disperse the, the promised funds, right? So you have that. So there is an enthusiasm from the international community today to be involved in that place. But because it goes through project money even more than in other places, the um, Minister of Planning gave me the example uh, where he says that, let's say that a pot of money is being promised for a particular project. By the time it reaches the communities, um, at best there is 20% of the money left that actually reaches the communities. Again, if we study international development, we know this, it's somewhere in the fine print that there is too much money that kind of evaporates just to keep the system going. So how come, for instance, um, so they, they call it the ice, they say we use the image of an ice cream cone that you pass around and by the time it's like the last person, most of it has just you know melted. I was just trying to think if we just don't see this as a, as a footnote, a critical footnote, but we center this as what is wrong with international <coughs> development. We can't we come to a place in which we call this corruption. There is a, it's not corruption in the sense of somebody sitting down and thinking, how do I steal this money? You don't even need that. Just the legal structures make that most money evaporates. So what would happen even conceptually or politically where we would displace our definition of corruption much more to places like that? And so I think it's just one example on how this, this, um, how this um, empirical work I'm not using it necessarily in a classical way in which I want to pre prevent, uh, provide evidence, but maybe again connected to this idea of epistemicide. It's not even that we don't know any of these things, but it's not centered as expertise. Mm -hmm. It's just anecdotes somehow. Um, and so I think maybe that, that um, relates a little bit to the question about how do we relate this to epistemicide. Um, <coughs> It's trying to see what, what, what is out there if we refuse the overrepresentation of uh, white male knowledges at the present. And so the killing of knowledge in that sense is... It's <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I think the example that I gave before, um, if we try to reverse this, that we literally can come up with diff fundamentally different ways to understand what the international development is supposed to be doing. Uh, and it's very far um, uh, from that. Um, so how I relate it to, to the rise, or maybe the existence of the in, enlarged attention to other knowledges, because we also have to say that that's the case. And it's not just black knowledges, or knowledges from that position, but also indigenous cosmologies, because we're you know losing the planet and everybody's panicking. Suddenly, we have rediscovered indigenous cosmologies. Again, we don't have to be cynical about this, but how do we discover them? And to what extent is it not just like adding them to be able to continue to do the same? In the same way that I think a lot of our um, brown women in the you know, imagined villages have been used over the years more to justify an existing system rather than to really uh, criticize it. Um, thank you very much for the question on um, the, the sources that, that I'm engaging with. Um, um, Fiction writers, uh, social media, but also uh, movie. We're doing some work with colleagues on comparing some of uh, this explosion of, um, you know, something like the Black Panther movie or Get Out, whatever. How um, there's a lot of problematic aspects in the sense of how come these things become so popular at the time. But some of the basic stuff that they are critiquing is again stuff that has been around all the time. Uh, so at no point. Do I, um, do I say that I would not engage with them? And I thank you for uh, reminding to, to maybe do that much more purposefully.
Uh, one of the ways in which I also think I want to introduce most of the chapters is by having vignettes and, and a more narrative approach to start uh, or to illustrate something before to go. And I think obviously engagement with any of the other um, sources of knowledge is in there um, will be uh, important. In terms of Doctors Without Borders um, and Blackness, I will interpret your question as, uh, and I think it's an important one. Um, there are practices in international development that really cater to literally saving our lives, right? Um, essentially. So the, the, the danger often is, you know, by making these this sweeping statements is somehow to categorize everything as, you know, it's bad, we need to do something else. I would say um, that maybe the question that should guide us is not necessarily whether the existing institutions, whether there are some of them that we should keep or not. We can, I think, from a practitioner point of view, that might be one of the first questions to answer. But if we turn it around and see that the purpose is, you know, this will to life or life, or you know, then um, trying to turn it around and how the structures, in even the structures that organizations like Doctors Without Borders are subjected to in the long run are also deployed um, in the opposite of what they're supposed to do. And so an example for me has been the, um, the Ebola crisis and something, and um, luckily we don't have to use it, no, I'm not going to say it because I have to touch with it, but let's say the Ebola crisis um, uh, on the continent, um, the way that we've often studied it or even practiced it, for instance, from a Western positionality, is like SMSing some money, giving some money, sending doctors, Again, at that moment when people are dying, this is not about saying all doctors should stay home because from a decolonial perspective we shouldn't be doing this. But it's trying to understand how us um, some uh, are, are thinking that medical emergencies or the literal survival of people is not affected by the structures that we try or we should critique is, is, is an important one. So in terms of Ebola, people did die obviously of the disease, but mostly of where they were contracting it and the structure around them and to what extent the development practices that we had have led to particular um, structures in place that does not allow countries to have a system in place. At the same time, very concretely today, is people's access to medications, for instance, also that defines whether they survive or not. And those are things that are decided in Washington, in Brussels, whatever, like with uh, intellectual property rights, amongst others, right? So it's trying to enlarge the scope on how we understand what is it that we uh, contribute to in terms of this wow. life or death. And then within that, it's not about being cynical and saying, you know, doctors without borders should pack up and go home. But within their workings, there are structures that reproduce the capacity of different places to have their medical systems in place as well, right? So I don't know if that answers your question, but okay, thank you. <coughs> um, good morning. Okay. Thank you for your presentation. It was, it was interesting. Um, <laughs> no, I just, you said it. You made the I just have two questions. Um, okay. <laughs> firstly, uh, Akasiro, would you, would you um, compare that with Ubuntu in some way? I would be very interested to hear your view on that. And secondly, um, I'm curious about your on-field research in Rwanda. Um, did you, by any chance, uh, talk to the um, or or talk to people who are related to the Banyamulenga people, um, given what is happening to them now and, and how they're being treated in the media? Thank you. So I just wanted to ask you a question in terms of the extent to which like um, messing with the form of the archive is important for your work, because sort of similar to the question I heard on social media, etc. Uh, in terms of your methodology when you're speaking to experts, you know, conceptually in terms of who has the power to speak and not to speak. So I just wonder how, whether it's people in Somaliland or etc., your colleagues, how speaking to people considered specialists or experts remains like with in line with the Western archive of who remains erased, you know, etc. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I think my question would relate to 
in terms of the extremism, is there a date when this starts, you know? Um, and what, what causes that type of thing, and you know, how, how do we relate to that? And then, um, in understanding that you look at this, you know, from kind of a Western type of vantage point, um, are we not also making, are you not also making the mistake of sort of homogenizing um, the black experience, if one has to put it that way? Right? And um, in that also, sort of, it has its problematics in terms of how you start to anthropologize I mean, very difficult notions within the South African context, or even the African context within that. Uh, and then, probably, in terms of reparations, um, is it not better to say that it, it is a continuous process because um, sort of the shading of um, how the empire has been built uh, and you know the, the entire global capitalist notion has been built, um, it's still continuing. Like um, the shading of lives within the military, you know, we 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 we're going west, we're not sort of staying within the continent. So so is, isn't it? Shouldn't we problematize it within that factor space that? Probably, you know, it's a continuous process. It's not something that you make it right for anything else because it's still continuing. We still see that, um, you know, uh, if one, so to say, the problem of colonialism. And then just lastly, um, you know, the, the absence of state, so to say, um, not just in the southern within the Somalia context, but within the entire African continent, per se. And probably, if we have to put it within the plan where the state is absent for that particular body, if one has to say. Um, how do we deal with it, in a sense? Because um, the entire issue of rights is, is, is related to the state and citizenry. And given that the entire body does, black body does not have a state, and the state is white and western, um, so to say, how do we put that and link it to that entire issue of you know, international relations and rights and being a citizen and you know, all of that, given that, if, you know, the citizen is white, um, yes. in that type of sense. Well, <laughs> I think my vibe was easier than this. <laughs> These are great questions. Um, I get you in Ubuntu. Um, trying to think how to answer this. So, um, I'm insecure of answering this because um, I know that I'm trying to study what Agachio might be, not necessarily in a definitional way, but as something that I didn't know about. In that sense, obviously, of our Ubuntu, we know slightly more, whatever. So, but when I see it and the, the, the way people talk about it, the um, the fact that putting value in, in the case of Agachira, it's not even just putting value in oneself as an individual that already does not necessarily just exist as an individual, but how that can only exist through the community and the communal. Um, there are a lot, um, I would say, of parallels, or there is at least no huge class clash with the things that are uh, being saying um, or being put forward uh, by Ubuntu that also, again, can be understood in many different ways. So in that sense, I, I, I think I really do not want necessarily to um, single out Agatiro as this one thing that Rwanda has and others don't. It just is, I think, a shared, and it's probably aspects of it can be found in other civilizations, in other places. It's more um, a particular expression uh, of um, what Brad Mosley would call humanness rather than humanity, right? But it's a particular stress of the possibility of humanity. So in that sense, I would obviously um, try to have conversations with the concept like to what extent um, that is going It's an example of where um, I, could, I would consider that as a knowledge cultivation thing in which things play into each other rather than trying to draw large distinctions in that sense. In terms of Banya Mulenge, um, given that my, my research was, um, it was in Kigali, and um, I did not necessarily engage with particular, or, or, um, or target particular communities to speak uh, to that. Um, then also, obviously the issue of, of the Congo, Eastern Congo, and the role of the Rwandan government 
and um, the situation of the different peoples there, it comes up sometimes, but it's because I was asking the question, was I guess it's not the first thing uh, that came up, so I don't want to speak to it um, too much. It is obviously something that, um, um, and this is where, where I would live in my own research, but part of the IHE research I did with colleagues in, um, in Kigali, where I would draw a distinction maybe with how I would, from my positionality, engage with this concept and how I think there are many different ways in which um, researchers in the country could engage with it. Because if you're going to preach as a government dignity, you can deploy that concept in different ways to engage with huge political uh, questions that are there at the time. Um, but again, uh, and this is, not, this is not reflecting our, um, I do think, or I, I try not to reproduce as a person that first does not live there but also does not speak the language, to reproduce this idea that I could use the research that I did to, to say a lot about internal politics or regional politics in that sense. Um, uh, the expert's question is a really good one. Um, I think I would in turn, in part, um, answer it so the choices that I think the choices I made when it came to my field work, um, because amongst other different language limitations uh, that I also obviously have from this research, right? But it's uh, it's different choices that I think I will or should make when I compile this whole list of other uh, people, practices, um, different registers I engage with. Um, so. The danger of re-erecting a westernized understanding of who's the expert by literally asking NGO people, asking um, academic researchers next to me, they're all politicians. Um, it's there and, and it's not there. So um, in that sense, I think I understand the expertise of trying to mitigate this uh, re-erection of western expertise, again in a relational or historical sense. Uh, or in the same way that I legitimize using blackness or epistemic blackness, is that there is a certain absence within the literature that I speak to of even those being considered as central people and experts for the questions that we're trying to ask. So for me, they're defeating people because my question was literally how have you experienced international involvement and because they're, they're the closest interlocutors with, uh, with those. Um, and I find it valuable because they're absent in, um, in the literature as we know it now. That in and of itself obviously is, a, is, is also a Eurocentric move or Western-centric um, move. And so the way that I try to then um, mitigate it a little bit is that I don't necessarily consider their answers as the full answers that we all should you know, run with now, but as the, the puzzles that, as I said, allow me to center different um, different concepts or different, um, or to denaturalize some of the, the mainstream things that we keep on doing and reproducing. So I see it as a very partial um, um, intervention. But I think it's an extremely important question when afterwards I'm gonna you know, curate or creating or putting all these other things together to make sure to not reproduce it in that sense. So I would say defining who the experts are should always also be in a relational sense but also depending on the question that you're asking, um, and then how you generalize uh, from that. So thank you uh, for that question. Epistemicide is dead, if I got the, no, to be speak. I don't, I don't think, I think for me the, the term epistemicide um, speaks of murder, but not necessarily whether that was successful. And I find that useful in a way to, to see this as, um, also in your next question as, as this ongoing thing, um, that, it, that has happened in a context of coloniality almost to all alternative. The, the real thing about coloniality is that we've chosen one way of knowing the world as the only one, and then disqualified all the others, right? And that has happened even within the intra-European context. Um, so deploying epistemicide as an analytical, but also very much as a political category then, is to refuse that as the endpoint as dead, because, and that's where, again, this idea of the knowledges are there, we don't even have to necessarily invent them. It's about how we redirect our gaze, where we go and look for 
expertise. Ideally, we don't need even the category expert or not expert, but in a context in which that's the way that we produce knowledge. I don't know. In a way, it's something that we have uh, to speak to. The other danger, obviously, is about uh, homogenizing or romanticizing or whatever the content then of this black experience or the black knowing or the black knowledges. I've been trying to work through how to valorize knowledge without necessarily have to answer just the question whether it's good or bad, better or worse. I find its value in the fact that I was never made to engage with it, and then we can see what we do with that. So in that sense, I don't think that necessarily all thought that comes, or all insights that come from the African experience or the black experience, um, as I said, are necessarily superior in and of themselves. So it's not an, an it's not a given, but again, the, the value is is relational in a systemic absence from before, or it's actually after erasure, let's say, that there is a value. And then there's so many things uh, we can do with that. This is also, again, where the limits are from, uh, as I said, my Western vantage point. That answer, that question, I think, um, might have to be answered systematically differently if we come from different vantage points, right? For instance, um, in scholarship uh, here in the continent. There's different priorities that will come up in, in, in a project like this. Um, reparations as a pro process that is still uh, ongoing. Yeah, I 100% agree with you. Reparations <coughs> might give the impression that we stop colonialism, we stop slavery, we can make the count and now you know this is for you um, going to give back. What coloniality helps is to show, first of all, the, the ongoing nature of that type of relationship. The reason why reparations for me is a useful, again, political, but also analytical tool uh, to bring up is that the refusal to engage with having to repair something is in part what normalizes the continuation of coloniality in the present. And especially through development, thought, and practice, it's so obfuscated that it turns out to be something of doing good. So that's where I, um, that's where I see the, the need to engage with repair or reparations as very much a project of the present, not to pay for past sins, but to be able to formulate. Because I think that's the biggest fear when, when we ask people to engage with reparations is that the, we will know very quickly that very little has changed. And, and I think that's, where, that's why we're not, not doing it, or why it's not that received. Why it's easier for Europe, for instance, to speak about international development than it is about Because uh, it's still ongoing. It would also have very huge consequences if you start considering the people that come in through the Mediterranean as people to whom you are indebted is different, even how you would translate that in policy terms then if you think this is a bunch of people that, you know, magically uh, they're working they're <coughs> hours and we can just choose whether we want to help them or not. Um, so for me that's the, um, the absence of the state and the citizen being white and European, that's a huge, I, that's a huge question of political science. Um, I think again I would turn it around. Um, so no, let's put it differently. In the first instance, I'm not necessarily in this project. Uh, the state, even though I come from an IR of political science, is not the thing that is at the center of, of my concern. But in flipping it around, um, if we take the state as one of the ways in which we organize communal life, rather than the only way, the way that IR has projected it or political science has projected it, to understand how society making, you know, the path that it should follow, then I do think that if we apply this to the condition of the people of African descent, whether um, whether it's in the US, whether it's in Europe, I think uh, sometimes soon we also have to engage much more seriously with Asia um, or on the African continent. I think the um, epistemic blackness allows us to, to destabilize the idea of the state in a much more profound way. Because in very few places, the state has worked for black people in general, to, put it, you know, to simplify it. 
But on the other hand as well, if we use it as, as a place from which to know, um, as an endless source of thinking on how, even though they were not white enough or are not white enough to be citizens, how the continuation of that life in community and society building continues. Because it's not just about rejecting the state as the only thing, but trying to find, and it's there, I mean, and, and there's people much more qualified that are doing this, uh, I'm sure, but how to, how to pluralize these understandings of what the state could be, if you want to keep that, that label, right? But, you know, to just move uh, outside of that, while critiquing, because it's not, again, about um, just rejecting it and then moving on to something else, but the states that we have today, how, can, how could we deploy them, building on these other knowledges in a way that actually would work, or that would include the idea of a citizen not just being white? I'm sure I did not answer that very well, but that's the first thing that came to mind. We have a question here. So one, um, and then someone else has a question. He's going to say, I want to the next round. No, 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 actually, can, can we move into the next round? So sorry, ask the question. Okay. No, you can move into the next round. Yeah, okay. Um, okay, so we'll just start. Uh, thanks, Olivia. Um, it's not a question, actually, it's a comment. Um, and I'd like to add to what you've said. I think, I think this is a fantastic project. Uh, I absolutely love it a bit. Uh, what I'd like to actually add is to say, if you need it, of course, is that I think the idea of epistemic correctness is very strong conceptually. Uh, it is linked really to the idea of epistemicide and genocide. And the archive. So the issue is then to thread it. Out. So how do you thread this through so that you then own that conceptual space? Mm -hmm. um, because that is one of the difficulties we face as African scholars. Uh, we come up with very brilliant concepts, but they remain on the fringes uh, of discourse. Uh, and, and, and we do not start studies and we do not start disciplines. Um, and so I'd like to see you to wrestle with this concept of the archive because the problem that I've, I've sensed in my own work, uh, particularly working with apartheid studies, is that in Africa I've seen less and less of what you call an archive. Right? Uh, it's easy to see an archive in Europe uh, and, and in the West. Uh, and here you see not an archive but burdens. And I can explain what I mean by this. So if, if, if you read uh, Roland Bart, um, you know, read it very much when I was doing my PhD. And, and then he, he Roland Bart talks about what he calls, for instance, Frenchicity. Uh, he says French people move around, you know, that Frenchicity. Those things that, that just attach yourself to your French. Uh, and those things are usually things that are good, that are part of the national image. And what he calls Italianicity, uh, you know, ideas of pasta and macaroni and good food and wine and so on. Because that Italian is <laughs> at the same time at the same time you do not have uh, Ita, you know let's say Mussolini's fascism as part of Italianicity. An Italian person can move around and not be settled with the heritages of fascism. They they carry them in archive of Good wine and good food and pasta, right? And why not? Um, and, and, and they are not settled with all these heritages, whether it's, we are talking about the mafia and today, coronavirus, for instance. <laughs> it, 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 it does not attach to the African. When, when, when you're an African on the other hand, the, the reverse happens. What you want to uh, excavate, like you want to do as an archive, Suddenly, I settled with Oshis oh, Mwanda, Ayutuzi, Ayutuzi. Uh, and, 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 and what you want to become an archive keeps being dismissed. And so, the master skill in our supervisor, and I'll suggest this quickly uh, because of time, was doing a study of youth who use violence in the American former settlement in South Africa during what are called service delivery protests. And you wanted to find out why. Is violence a form of communication? We sit down and think about a theoretical framework. 
and we can't find a theoretical framework from South Africa. Uh, he had to use Zizek, six sideways reflections on violence. He had to use Foucault, who was writing about the clinic and the prison in France in the 18th century or wherever. He could not find a theory from here, from South Africa, to leverage, to talk about the experiences of youth in South Africa. Why is it so difficult to leverage the African archive, the South African archive, so that students studying violence in Tamerite can just say, yeah, I'm using the theory, but so and so in Africa, in South Africa, and so on. And then, so, so, so I'm saying, be wary of how that archive slash burden uh, 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 dichotomy is always going to, to hamstring you every single time you try to say Agachiro. Mm -hmm. And show that no, Agachiro is like Italianicity. Mm -hmm. you, you, you know, but you will be pulled back to how many how many millions were killed in the in the, in the genocide, in the and so on. So yeah. I think this is a fantastic project and, and I'm looking forward to seeing how it how it ends. <laughs> Thank you. Um, hi, uh, yes, I will um, agree with Nyasha. I also think this is a great project. Um, and uh, the question that I wanted to ask you, because um, I'm thinking about different things that you said in your presenting, um, about the dislocation of colonial power, um, about uh, colonial amnesia, and then uh, towards the end you spoke about um, thinking, thinking about what it is that you were meant to forget. Um, so now I was just wondering, you know, when 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 you speak um, to 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 black people, or um, you know, get to the idea of a of a um, a black epistemology. Are, are you considering or um, are you going to maybe uh, break into the question of how much um, uh, black knowledge has itself brought into the idea of the white burden um, in, 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 you know, in, in these uh, uh, development terms? Um, and then I'm, I'm also thinking about uh, uh, Think about it in terms of uh, Bob Marley's um, redemption song, right? So, if we're speaking about colonial amnesia, for instance, um, how do we see colonial amnesia from uh, where where it resides in blackness? So, what uh, blackness and black knowledge has chosen? to forget mm -hmm. about um, you know, um, colo colo um, col coloniality and colonialism. Um, and <coughs> how it then, how, how what we were meant to forget, even when we ourselves have chosen to forget it, um, then could, could be a, a, a form of reproducing the very, over representation that we say we 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 want out of, you know, and how uh, lastly it could be a, a survival strategy, um, survival. Um, funny word. <laughs> I want to I want to think of a different one, but um, because now I'm thinking, is it survival when? Um, what the, 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 the only sort of thing that um, that that forget that, that our colonial amnesia um, brings back to us is, is the little crumbs that, that we can live on depending on, on on which level of a black privilege or a, a move towards a whiter privilege um, can can bring us. Thank you. Um, I felt interpolated by Nyasha, so I feel like I ought to speak on that very point, Nyasha, which is absolutely uh, crucial. And it brings me back to your opening rhetorical gesture, which you repeat, and you know, we've been sharing this space here, and you do very often, which is important for you, when you say, I speak from a Western vantage point, I speak from a European vantage point. And I understand why you do it, uh, 
Um, but I want to just throw it at you. I don't have a, a, a position on this. It's something that I grapple with. And I'm thinking about the scholarship that is coming from Europe. Uh, you, met, you mentioned the Sosa Santos, which is from Portugal. And scholarship that is now trying to reconfigure this notion of Europe, Eurocentrism, uh, the West. You know, for instance, from the margins of Europe, some friends we share are heavily invested in this project that, for instance, sees uh, the south of Europe and the south of Italy, which is the one place, whenever I identify myself, which I try not to do, I would identify myself with. <laughs> and uh, in that case, they say, well, yes. Well, and they talk about coloniality as being at the receiving end of coloniality. They talk about decolonization as a project in which they have agency because we are, they say, uh, as I say, I, I, I'm, I, I have a complex relationship with this. I, I struggle to uh, embrace it because I think it's a little bit too easy sometimes to, to, to claim to be at the receiving end of a coloniality, you know, uh, if you come from a, a space which is at the border of coloniality. But they, they make this gesture. And, and so I, I wonder whether it would be useful for you and for the project to, to, to somehow use your positionality, not so much to claim a vantage point, but to explode the very notion of that vantage point somehow. I, I don't know how it can be that. It's something I grapple with myself. I'm going to take in the comment and thank you for it. Um, I think, or maybe just to, to underscore it, I, I'm really trying to do a, a theory project, and not necessarily because I think theory is a superior way of knowing, but you know, to contribute to, to this idea that theory can only be produced from certain places or vantage points. And that's also why maybe when I said which are the fields that I want to contribute to, it clearly did not say African studies or even black studies, right? Because, um, not because there might not be any contribution, um, it's because I want to speak to how we make sense of the international. So in that sense, I'm, I'm really trying to introduce epistemic blackness into that, in, uh, in what Sabelo has called the need to provincialize Africa. Um, <clears throat> maybe then to follow on uh, Pierre first on your question the way I, I try to use um, disclaimers of positionality and I struggle with that sometimes is, is I'm trying not to necessarily that's why I said it's not about an identity because even that has changed so much and let's say I don't know these things change it's not about fixing something nor is it to continue an idea of zero sum as, as in, and that's also why I invoke this idea of, of knowledge cultivation, is literally endless. And, and if we try to, to suck out the idea of competition when we claim our positionality, we'd be surprised how much more relaxed conversations people can have. Because, and that's where I bring in the will to power over, over will to life sometimes. We see now that, especially in work circles, when people say their positionality and sorry I'm white, sorry I'm a white woman, whatever, so stuff, um, often what follows onto that is then to be able to continue to speak from the same power position or to make a whole project about a self-referential thing. And so what I'm trying to do with this is to um, understand for myself if, if I say that my positionality happens to be African, in the positive sense, being a, of the African diaspora has given me insights just by the mere gaze of my everyday life that some other colleagues don't. It's not in a competition or in a zero sum, but that is my positive contribution to the scholarship. Being from a Western positionality means that I might have been ex in a very particular way socialized into whiteness. Mm -hmm. And I, again, I don't mean the, the but, um, and it's a type of whiteness, to follow on the next question, that, that is shared throughout the colonial world, and it expresses itself in different ways. Um, and so it expresses, in my case, in the fact that I do speak many languages, but none of them are non-colonial, non-European languages. There have to be consequences to that in the way I do research, and the, 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 the consequences are drawn from what I, from what I research. 
And the reason why I don't find that limiting in any way, if we understand that research is a communal thing, it's <coughs> <coughs> fine that I'm just this tiny little job. Like, and again, that goes often against how we are trained to portray our research as a one way in which we're going to shed light slightly better on a truth that's supposedly there. So in that sense, I, um, I, I think in the present, I think it's premature to explode these vantage points because they're often used to even have more power. Often when people say like, no, but I also, you know, uh, encounter oppression, I think it's useful in a conversation, but we always have to think when you bring it up, is it to say, no, that means that I can also speak to whatever you're speaking, mm -hmm. or that I can actually understand what you're saying, or mm -hmm. so what, what happens um, there. So that's why I don't have a problem to really delineate in a very tiny corner of the place from which we can know the world that I just happen to be from that point, and then try to work with that um, in, in my environment. And, and I want to come back to this, this idea of, um, of coloniality, but I, that's, I think the definition of whiteness, that's the one I wanted to, to, to use, and I think it speaks to your question. And it allows me maybe to reiterate the fact that epistemic blackness is not about um, finding a pure place of knowing or a place where better knowledge is there per se. I think the question comes before what just happens, especially because of my experience, as was mentioned, is not a homogeneous one. And in the present, I would say that some of the most staunch um, champions of colonial desires of um, capitalist accumulation, who find them here? And this is not even necessary to be that say, you don't have the right because you come from this particular colonial experience to desire wealth in the way that we're doing. Um, yeah, I think epistemic blackness as, a, as an epistemological project is to maybe try to resist the judgmental gaze when it comes to knowledge before we've researched it. Um, having said that, I do think that a very productive way or cultivating way of using the fruits that we might have by engaging with epistemic blackness would be to address our desires of coloniality that we still share in the previously or currently colonized world, because it's, it's, it's a real uh, problem. And a very concrete example I will give you is I research Agachiro and Wanga. I interview another, whatever, elite slash uh, the minister of East African communities at that time um, for Rwanda, and I ask her, um, you know, you guys have uh, started talking about Agachiro and as a, as a government thing, whatever, so how would you give me an example of Agachiro as a system of thought in your everyday practice as a minister of East Africa? And she gives me the example of the second-hand clothing, uh, and I don't know if any of you followed it, but the second-hand clothing markets, for instance, in East African community. Her point was that at some point we started realizing how is it that as a continent, but especially this region also, we end up the, the dustbin, let's say, of clothing sector elsewhere in the world. She's like, you have big containers coming in, often the clothes are rotten, whatever. On the UK side, it's really like, if I don't like my clothes anymore, we open this thing, we put the clothes in it, and nobody thinks where they go, right? Mm -hmm. So she gives me the other side of it, and she says, I give you this as an example of Agachiro because there is no logic in which us as people or my people, we should find this normal. And so within an East African community, <laughs> Uh, they are trying to, and they have uh, band-aid, meaning, she said, uh, we used to have, especially Kenya, flourishing uh, industrial, um, you know, an industry of um, clothing, and all of that has been killed and continues to be killed through the second hand uh, clothing. At the same time, we obviously have a lot of, in the short term, people in Kigali and the rest of the country saying, really great idea, but we really need these clothes at the moment, so not everybody's on board with that. Mm -hmm. But also, again, trying to think beyond the capitalist mode of production, it's not necessarily that that is a good or a bad thing, right? But so, for me, it's about how can we deploy these insights then to, to then go and say, where do we reproduce, even with Agachiro, coloniality, or where can we deploy it for an anti-colonial project? So, I wouldn't say that any of Knowledge that comes from a black position is by definition anti-colonial, it isn't. Mm -hmm. But I think if we want to find knowledges to engage in an anti-colonial way, we have to seriously include the insights that come from the most colonized people in this moment in history in a North Side um, context.
Okay, thank you very much. Um, I would like just to, to clarify on Agachiro in general understanding. So, Agachiro is a word like here in South Africa. When they say Lobora, everyone understands what Lobora is. So, it's spoken in Burundi, Rwanda, east of DRC, Uganda, and in Tanzania, especially in Kikoma. So, uh, Agachiro deals with uh, human beings today. Uh, which means that it's applied to human beings. If it's applied, it's applied on things, it's called Ikichiro. It changed from Agachiro to Ikichiro. And uh, I think for, for, for us to understand more, it's like if you consider like what um, Maboko Percy More said when he was explaining African philosophy, like um, during apartheid time, one white woman was having value than 200 black men. So then compare that one person had more agachiro than 200 people. Then that's what means agachiro. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so, I actually have a question. Um, so the way that you presented your book talk, you talk, you gave us context about how you came to the question. But I didn't necessarily see it in the structure of the chapters. And so the, the question that I have, if we're thinking about how we know what we know and the ways that there are attempts to kill what we know, how will you account for that in the writing? Um, so like, you know, how do you plan to articulate how you came to ask the questions that you came to ask? How did you know to ask the questions that you asked? Um, uh, so that's the first one. And then also, there was a moment when you were talking about some of your field work in the U.S. and you said that um, you asked people in the U.S. what their contemporary understandings of black power were. And so I'm curious, but just what some of those answers were. But then in the follow-up to that, you said that perhaps there was a more developed understanding of reparations in the context of the, in the, context of the U.S. And you've already spoken to this a little bit, but one of the things that, and this is not really a question, but it's one of the things that I think about when I think about the attempt to repair. Um, because the question that I have is like, what does it actually mean to repair? Um, like, is it even possible to do so? Um, you know, what would that entail? But then, but then even if it were to occur, what would that mean about the way that those of us who need repair relate to those of to those of them who owe us repair mm -hmm. and like and then how does that like how do we account for that as a human experience because this is one of the questions that i have about reparations it's like okay so is there some point at which they have done enough and my answer to that is no like they can never <laughs> but but in thinking about that i'm just so <laughs> Well, I think in addition to the American experience of black power, I'm also realizing that in your in your research, most of the internal just also comes from the black studies. Uh, see Martin Spiller, and, uh, and you continue with Fred Martin. So, so I'm curious how how you put that conversation together with also the idea of ontology of a black person, ontology of black. Person. Mm -hmm. which sometimes can be eradicated. Uh, and so forms of renewal, of repair, uh, are they possible in, in locating them within the, the studies of political sciences or even uh, uh, yeah, in your case? And so, so I'm wondering how, so I'm, I'm, I guess I'm curious in terms of how that question is responded to in terms of black studies, in terms of different experiences in Africa. So, um, great questions. How do I include how I came to know in the, in the structure? So I think one place obviously would be the introduction a little bit. Like, um, but I think the other place where I also was um, thinking, as I said, like 
if one way is to start chapters with telling a little story, that could be one. Um, and I think I need, I, I need or I want to pierce it uh, throughout, and that's maybe what I meant with, I want this also to be a pedagogical project to mm -hmm. some extent, to break through some of, again, the myths of how we think we learn and you know, how, how we know. Um, a lot of these people I discovered actually while well, not being in academia, but working as a journalist, that tells us <laughs> something. And that was in Belgium, but, uh, and I was responsible for the whole Africa disc, because you know, with one person you can cover the whole continent. I'm exaggerating a little bit, but so one of the anecdotes that, that, that come to mind for me is, for instance, um, how I started to engage with Thomas Sankara was not because I realized that there's a huge hole in how I understand development and debt and all these things in the international system. But because I was randomly sent to Burkina Faso to attend the FESPACO and my editor and she said, you also need to come back with a story that lasts longer than just describing the movies that you watched. And at that time I had to admit, I know where it is, it's probably poor, like I'm simplifying a little bit, but not that much, right? Um, what do I know about this place? Apart from the fact that it was colonized by the French and so I, I started, um, I asked, actually apart from Wikipedia, but I, I asked around um, my, um, my Rwandan and other African friends and family members in Belgium, and I, so actually always the same simplistic question, what do you know, what do you think, how you define, so I said, I said Burkina Faso, what do you say, it's like, and everybody said Thomas Saka, right? And then, then he rang a bell and I remember my dad mentioning this guy, whatever. Uh, so that's the start of that journey, but it comes from, it's, it goes hand in hand with a lot of shame, this feeling that you've been cheated out of something, and then somehow by digging into it, that you get a sense of this vastness of stuff that is around. It's not even about fanboying him or being in favor of him. It's about, again, what, there was a lot in what he said that we clearly needed to forget. And so um, this, this would be like, ways in which I would, I think throughout the text, maybe more than, or maybe probably in the introduction as a methodology, but to try and contextualize it that way. And it will also come up, I guess, when I speak to epistemicide uh, somewhere there. So thank you for that question. Um, it's actually also there, I think, by doing the interviews, because in the end, I told my editor-in-chief, I mean, the story I want to bring is to see to what extent, and that was 2011, when the other guy was still in power. Um, to what extent the spirit of Thomas Sakai is still in the streets of Wakadulu and have you know, interviewed people different generations, but also very naively went into bookshops asking, hi, I'm looking for books of Thomas Sankara. And he's like, we don't have that here. I'm like, okay, I'll go to the next one. So I go to the next one. But like this, this complete detachment from the reality of a place in, that is being run by the person you know, that is um, believed to have been part of his assassination and still being able to like roll in there like your average other European journalist would and ask, where can I find the books of, you know, of Thomas Sankara, right? So I think we should maybe, yeah, one of the contributions I want to do is to demystify um, some of, of, of uh, the shame of not knowing that comes with, I think all of us, if we do, if we were honest about that, that's how we, we know. And I want to maybe center that a little bit. Um, Black power. Um, so in a way, I think why the reason, because there is maybe in contrast to the two other examples um, that I don't want to call case studies, but Somalia, the, the fields, uh, Somalia and Agachiro and, and Rwanda, um, is that there is a lot of information on paper that I could just do on this research when it comes to black power, not just in the US even. So the reason why I actually decided to do the same method as first inquiry was to also break a little bit uh, what would happen if I did not start my research with disk research, just like kind of randomly. And that's why I don't use it as a representative um, um, example. This is what people in the US think about power today, right? And for the US, it actually makes sense for us immediately that that could never come out of, I don't know how many thousand interviews even. Um, so, so obviously that the, the the answers were varied depending on who, uh, some of the more classic ones that would repeat stuff that they've written about themselves because I interviewed some colleagues. Um, so things that I could be find in books. But the example um, that, that really somehow um, 
uh, confirmed for me why it might have been a good idea to start the research that way. And I think I mentioned it to you. Uh, I was at Howard University. My plan was to interview one professor there, uh, Tony Medina, who is um, teaches uh, poetry and creative writing. Howard University being an historically black uh, institution of higher education. Um, and so it, he invited me instead to just be in his classroom. And halfway through, he's like, oh, by the way, this is Olivia. She's doing research on black power. What do you guys think? And so everybody answered. And they were like undergrads, um, poetry students. And their answers went from black power is not to have to be subjected to gentrification of my neighborhood to my black power is me waking up and being present here today. Just like to, to somehow signal in this. And, and that is next to all the very intellectual answers that I was given. So maybe it answers also some of the questions on how can we break this idea of expertise and who gets to define for us what black power is. Um, yeah, I find that very like, insightful. What does it mean to repair? Is it possible? I wouldn't say it's, I wouldn't say it's possible. I think it's necessary. And that's part of the answer I gave before, right? Mm -hmm. like the political approaches of engaging with that. The question about what that means in interhuman um, um, in interhuman relations, I am... Um, Obviously, I mean, we're studying or I'm engaging with this from an IR perspective, which in my book would be to some extent uh, very much structural to begin with, right? But I do think, um, especially from feminist understanding of reality, where the public, the private, the, whatever, like this, this, the question that you ask is not detached from that. Mm -hmm. I would say that. And, that's the, and I want to think more about it, but um, if I think it's an integral part of, of um, necessary behaving. So in international, uh, in interhuman conversations, I think I would bring much more up the term healing maybe than repairing mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, you need to give me this, I calculate it, I'm good. I do think we need to do that at the structural level on how we organize the international of international relations, but I think the connection between those two is that you can't have or even think of it if we would not, if the healing process, if we're not willing to do that um, on the structure. And how to, I think I don't have an answer of black studies and IR and politics, but that's the reason why I'm doing it, um, because I've always felt it very strange that um, there seems to be such a huge engagement with the black condition, the black conditions, black experiences and knowings in a particular field of study and how something like international relations has been able to stay like so white. It does not make sense in terms of how history happened, right? And also we have more and more people now also um, trying to, um, like Bob Vitalis for instance, like when we trace even the origin of IR as a discipline, it was really like how we're going to the same as it's not the same, but how to deal with the color, the people of color, the colored people, whatever, with the race, with the, the, you know. So even as a genealogy, could never have been a discipline that was just, you know, a, a, a white or Western perspective of how to organize the international, but it became that. So in that sense, IR is in and of itself a colonial project. Um, so a part of what I want to do is is to, to break, break through that fragmentation that on the one hand you can study black people and on the other hand you do international relations. Um, I think that I don't necessarily have the desire to, to do any of this just for the sake of the disciplines in and of themselves, right? So in that sense, that's why I'm saying like my contribution might not be huge in, in black studies, nor do I necessarily want to erect just IR for the sake of it or salvage it. But I think if we're gonna study the international, my contribution would have to be to, to have a conversation. But I do think that black studies might be asking sometimes different questions, sometimes similar questions than some of the questions I'm asking here. So again, in a non-zero sum game, I'm just very happy that black studies exist and that I can try and unpick Afro-optimism, pessimism, whatever, but also maybe break through some of the um, uh, US or Western centrism within those studies themselves at that particular experience. I'm really tired. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Thank you, everyone. <laughs>